My name is Era, and I'm the host of the Tamil Creator Podcast. I chat with creators from all over the world to share their stories and discuss hot topics in a way that I hope inspires, educates, and entertains you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Tamil Creator. This is your host, Era, and today I have a super interesting guest on the podcast. His name is Amarnath Amarna Singham. My goodness, I butchered his name, but he goes by Amar. And Amar has a pretty, Amarnath has a pretty interesting kind of career. He's an assistant professor in the School of Religion and is cross-listed at the Department of Political Studies at Queen's University. He's also a senior research fellow at the Institute of Strategic Dialogue, um, associate fellow at the International Center of Study of Radicalization, and associate fellow at the Global Network on Extremism and Technology. So basically, he's a smart guy. Um, so his kind of research interests, and he's really passionate about research, uh, is radicalization, terrorism, dis diaspora politics, post-war reconstruction in the society, society, society I'm not going to pronounce it. And uh, he's also the author of a few books as well. And he's written a bunch of papers and articles for a number of publications, including the New York Times, Washington Post, and The Atlantic. Um, you know, I've, since, since I've done such a terrible job introducing Amarnath, I'll let him kind of introduce himself talk about a bit more about, you know, uh, his upbringing, kind of why he kind of delved into this interesting path that he's kind of taken. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Um, congrats on the twins. Congrats on the podcast. Uh, we haven't actually seen each other in a while, um, but that, that's true basically for everyone now. So, <laughs> <laughs> so true. Um, but yeah, congrats on all that. Um, I mean, in terms of, um, I mean, where do you want me to start? I'm going to start from like my birth. <laughs> Yeah, just like how you grew up, like, you know, if you were born here, born in Sri Lanka, just kind of how everything kind of came to be. Um, so I was born in Sri Lanka in 1982 in Jaffna, um, kind of uh, just as the war was kicking off or just as the conflict was kicking off. Um, the kind of immediate reason I think we left Sri Lanka was the invasion of the Indian Army uh, in the late 80s. Um, there was a so I have like flashes of memory of you know living in a bunker, uh, running in and out of bunkers, um, bombs being dropped, etc., um, and eating very stale crackers. <clears throat> um, and and uh, it's funny because the, the stale crackers are kind of embedded in my memory in in a, in a weird way. And so, um, so that was around eighty seven. We uh, left in 88 and arrived here in May 88. And so I've been in Toronto basically ever since elementary school here, high school here, university um, uh, was in, you know, Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo for the PhD. Um, so I've been in Ontario basically since, since we got here. Got it. And yeah, like I said, you know, we talked a lot about this, like your academic interest and kind of the interesting work you're doing, but before we kind of get into that, something I found interesting about you that I didn't know until I, you know, followed you on social media is, you know, your love of hip hop, you know, tell us about that, because, you know, you definitely yeah. know your hip hop. And yeah, tell us about that. Who are some of your favorite artists? Kind of get into that. Yeah, so I mean, um, in, in the I mean, you know, I grew up in the era of Tupac, Biggie, Big L, Big Pun, um, and so the late 90s, basically. And so I, you know, I got into kind of hip hop culture through break dancing, um, and I was very bad at break dancing. <laughs> we, we, we did the typical, you know, uh, Tamil shows and stuff like that. Um, and then I was in uh, kind of the battle rap scene, making uh, songs and things like that from about 96 seven to about 2007, I would say. Uh, so this was like mp3.com, uh, okay. Napster, Napster uh, period. Um, and so we have, you know, we had several songs out. It was, it was, it was a group called Illogic. It was me, a Chinese guy and a black guy, <laughs> a very multicultural Toronto group. Um, but we, you know, we grew up in the kind of battle rap scene before, um, not how it is now. Now it's very intense and very, um, uh, very structured and very and, and very professionalized because of you know uh, Drake's involvement in in funding some of these projects etc. But back then it was like basement parties and um, stuff like that. So that that's kind of so I you know I was I was making songs and battling for ten years. Um, this was like throughout undergrad as well. So it's like uh, so, so th that's kind of that's kind of the generation I came up in. 
Um, it was also kind of a heartbreaking period because, you know, you had Tupac killed in 96, you had Biggie killed in 97, you had Big L killed in 99, you had Big Pun die in 2000. Um, and so basically all of the people that we were listening to were dropping dead um, one after the other. And so, um, and then, I, I, then the 2000s came um, and I wasn't a huge fan of anyone really in the 2000s except, maybe, except Eminem. Um, and uh, and then maybe jump a decade to like Kendrick and Cole, et cetera. But um, that that a lot a lot of the two thousands I thought was kind of garbage. But <laughs> but um, um, but I mean, if you in terms of like my top five, I guess Dead or Alive, um, I would say I mean Shaq had a good list when when he was asked about it. Um, I forget by who I think it was Kevin Hart or something, um, where he said you know uh, Eminem, Little Wayne. Tupac, Biggie, and Jay Z, which I, you know, which I think is a solid list, which I would probably agree with. I still can't get over the fact that you're. A <laughs> I'm trying to picture that right now, but no, it's, it wasn't great because it was, <laughs> it, it was, it, you know, it was one of these times where it's like if you could do anything with your feet, you were considered a break dancer, and so, especially in Scarborough, and so you would get into these weird uh, dance contests and shows. And I remember the exact moment I decided I'm never going to do it again is when. I think it was a show at Seneca College, and I was like given the opportunity to do the 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 feature, right? The the the, the main guy on the floor, and so I was doing my little nonsense uh, feet maneuvers. And then the co competitor or the or the group that came after us also had a guy who had his kind of moment on the floor, and he started like spinning on his head, right? And, <laughs> and so I was like, okay, I'm I'm just gonna retire. Um, and and so there's no point in like. And, and they're all Tamil, uh, young Tamil guys too. And so I was like, fuck this, this is done. Um, and, and so there's no point, there's no point in competing with this because I'm obviously not going to be ever spinning on my head. Um, so that was the end of that uh, sh short lived career as a break dancer. So, so I'm guessing you're better at the freestyle battles than the, the break dancing battles. Yeah, I mean, I still write from time to time. Um, I haven't recorded in a long time. Um, uh, I haven't freestyled in a long time, but, but, but that was, yeah, that, that's where I kind of, found the passion, I guess. Um, it was much it was much more fun. Um, and it fit my personality, I think, as kind of um, the, the ability to like make fun of people and, and roast. And <laughs> I, I, found, I found I found it much more useful. <laughs> <laughs> By just picturing like that like scene like in um, that uh, was it the Eminem movie. But yeah, I just I'm just picturing that. Um, yeah, yeah. Eight mile, yeah. Eight mile, sorry, my goodness. But I feel like that movie was just yesterday, but it's actually been like almost like 10 years or like eight years, right? No, it's been longer than that. I mean, it's uh, I think it's oh, been wow. closer closer to twenty now. I mean, th this is the thing with Eminem is he came out just when everybody was dying off. <laughs> so yeah. his first album was ninety nine, and so he kind of he got Dre's stamp of approval. Um, <clears throat> and if you think, I mean, I I don't know many rappers as, aside from like Busta Rhymes who can and LL Cool J who can kind of boast of a. 21 year whatever it is now 22 year career um and having a platinum album every decade that he's been out right and, and i think the spotify put out a list of their top five stream streaming artists i think a couple weeks ago and eminem's like top three so the dudes in his dudes turned 50 this year and he's still you know top five streaming on spotify and so um it's madness yeah i think um he, he's, a, he's a he's a different he's a different animal i'm a big fan of people in any industry that do something maybe they're not like it's crazy that Eminem is both like longevity and like you know like you said like his stuff is good consistently yeah. like even somebody that's like maybe not top five but they're like top 40 but they're top 40 for like in the NBA like I'm a fan of somebody who's able to have a career for like 20 years like LeBron is like an anomaly you know a guy yeah. that's been that good for 15 years so if you had a choice between having an out of the world you know amazing two three year run as a a rapper or like someone that is like you know tier two rapper or like you know hip-hop artist that's had an American you know I guess LL Cool J would probably fall under that yeah. for 20 years who would you rather what would you rather have oh no the longevity I think is much more interesting and impressive um and and that's how kind of legends are made in a way right and I think that that's much more because I, I mean I've forgotten more rappers than have been out that long, right? And then the same, I mean, Vince Carter was dunking in his 40s too, right? And so, <laughs> and so it was like, I think I think that 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 ability to maintain not that not only that level of kind of skill 
um, and popular interest, but also that level of interest in the game or interest in the art or whatever it might be is also pretty impressive. And I say that as someone who's like constantly distracted and constantly pulled in different directions um, and, and just maintaining, um, maintaining kind of interest in something that long um, it is, is in itself kind of impressive. I mean, um, if you look at, you know, interviews with these guys now, it's like, um, they're constantly trying to improve themselves. I mean, Kobe was a good example as well. It's, it's constantly trying to just get that extra 1% of, of skill and energy and um, commitment to the sport, um, which, I mean, I think that's much more impressive than, oh, you were, you know, you won a dunk contest and, and then you were, then you were, nobody heard of you again. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so interesting thing about, um, you know, like, because you grew up like you, you said you came to like Canada when you're like in your like teenager just around teenage years and like just talking to like a bunch of folks that kind of grew up in that age where like that first you know wave of kind of young Sri Lankan men like Tamil men from Sri Lanka that kind of grew up in Scarborough and yeah. you know we had like kind of the you know you referenced it in your TC article which kind of you know I saw a little bit of that and I'm pretty sure you saw a bit more of that kind of like the gang violence kind of era where there's a lot of it for maybe five, six years before things kind of got cleaned up. I feel like that's also kind of one of the reasons I see a lot of young Tamil men in that age group that are kind of older now love hip hop because hip hop is obviously like a product of kind of the environment that genre of music kind of came from. So, you know, that kind of got me thinking about that. Like, tell us how it was, you know, growing up in, you know, Scarborough at that time, because, you know, you mentioned you saw or like experienced things, especially during that time that maybe, you know, someone like myself or even younger probably wouldn't be aware of. So, yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah, we came, uh, I came when I was six in 1988 and then basically grew up uh, throughout in Toronto throughout the nineties. Um, things got really bad. I would say in 94, 95 ish when uh, the kind of street gang war between AK Cunnan in the East and, and, and the Velvet Tetheria or VVT gang in the West really popped off. Um, and so people, you know, I, I had friends getting shot in the leg. I had friends who were shot, um, gun violence constantly. Um, there was a kind of, which finally what led, I think, the community to really get involved was there was a, I forget his name, but there was a young kid who was just like doing his homework at a coffee shop at coffee time. And just by a case of mistaken identity, he was shot and killed by, um, I forget which side it was, but um, this was 96 or something. Um, and so I talk about it in the book, actually, in my the diaspora book. But um, that was kind of the key moment where uh, people, you know, community leaders got involved and tried to do something. And that didn't really help uh, actually bring anything, uh, anything, bring the streets, you know, quiet, quiet down the streets in any way. Um, but it was a fearful time. I mean, my parents, I remember vividly my parents telling me, um, you know, don't go to coffee shops, don't go to restaurants, don't hang out here, don't go to Scarborough Town Center, you know, don't, don't hang out in groups. Um, and, and law enforcement and cops and even mall security at the time um, would come and break you up if you were like six or seven Tamil guys standing by the railing, you know, trying to pick up girls or something. They would come in, they would come and be like, you guys got to disperse, right? And so, um, because they assumed that something was going to happen. And often, I mean, often it did. I mean, we got into a lot of fights in Scarborough Town Center, um, I was part of this like crew, I guess, at the time as well. And um, we got into a lot of fights at Carver Town Center and other places. Um, so it was a scary time in many ways, um, constant fights at clubs and, and, and things like that. And what kind of brought everything to a close remarkably was in 2003, uh, the Canadian government decided to merge. It was known as uh, Project 1050, uh, decided to merge uh, immigration status with gang involvement, which was the first time it's ever been done. And so we, so they, they said, if you're, if you're not a citizen of Canada and you were just a, you know, refugee claimant or a, uh, or a landed immigrant or whatever, but you were, and, and there was, it was provable that you were committing crimes on behalf of the gang, you could be deported. Um, and so in 2003, all the top tier leaders of both AK Kanan and VVT were deported back to Sri Lanka. Um, and so that basically brought the gang violence to a close almost overnight, right? We woke up one day and was like, where did everybody go? Right? <laughs> it, was, it was insanity. And so that was the first time um, those two things were merged together to try to try to bring down the gang violence. And, it, and it, it succeeded even though from like a, 
I guess, human rights perspective, it's a bit dodgy, but um, it, it worked, right? It, it, did, it did bring the violence to an end. Um, and luckily, like that's when I was starting university, and and so thing I can actually focus on other things um, like rap, <laughs> and, so, um, and so things kind of moved on from there. But it, it, from like ninety five to two thousand three, it was dicey. Um, it, was, it was really dicey in scrub room. This episode is sponsored by nobody. That's right, nobody. So if you could be kind enough to hit that subscribe button, that would mean a lot to me. One thing I noticed like recently, I don't know when I checked, but you know, whenever I'm about to like interview somebody, I kind of just refresh myself. And um, I know you're active on Twitter, but when I checked, I noticed a little something different. You're now a certified blue check mark. So yeah. when did you know when did that happen and how did that happen? <laughs> um, I mean that had to do a bit of uh, that's been a lot around for a while, but that arose because I was because of the project, particularly with ISIS and Al Qaeda, and so I was from 2013 to 2020, and, and to some extent even continuing, I was interviewing ISIS fighters, I was interviewing Al Qaeda fighters over Skype, um, you know, text message, etc. Active active fighters who are in Syria and Iraq, and. Um, then I started to get some threats and death threats here and there, uh, a lot of trolling in the online space. Um, and so I kind of just, back then you can actually apply for a blue check mark, right? And, and, and so I just kind of applied um, just to keep myself safe and in, in some way, um, keep myself verified literally um, as, a, as an account. And so that's kind of where that came from. Um, shortly after that, Twitter stopped its verification process, usually at, because of the Trump administration and because all these kind of neo-Nazis were getting blue checks and all these guys were kind of peddling in hate speech and Islamophobia and uh, racism were getting blue checks. And so Twitter just put a stop to it for a while. Um, I think that's still going on. Um, but yeah, that, that's where the blue check came from, just to kind of um, protect myself, I guess, from weird trolls and, 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 and so on. Yeah, I was going to say, because in the line of work that you do, or at least kind of your interest, you know, the, your interest, like you're dealing with some pretty heavy and, contra you know, potentially controversial subject matters. Like, have you ever had kind of, you know, you kind of talked about death threats, but like, was there any time when you actually got a message or whatever it was where you actually felt like, you know, maybe I should stop kind of putting my thoughts out there, or like, you know, maybe not focus on this? <laughs> No, I mean, I think um, it comes with the territory to some extent. Um, the overseas threats from ISIS fighters um, wasn't too scary because they were usually just DMing you on Twitter or something like that. Um, when, it's funny because whenever I tell people that, they're like, well, it, you're, it's not just anyone DMing you. It's like ISIS fighters. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, it was like, you know, they're far away. They're not doing anything. Um, um, and so that wasn't too much of a concern. But when I started studying like neo-Nazis again and, <clears throat> um, and, and, and different kind of content, um, then this was like domestic people sending you, you know, not necessarily death threats, but hate mail, um, kind of generic hate mail, which I generally just ignored. But um, yeah, it, I mean, it does come, I get, I get probably four or five a month on whatever topic um, that I put out there. Um, the, the 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 most hate mail I've ever gotten actually was uh, from kind of people in Quebec because I I me and my friend Hisham Tifladi had written an article on Islamophobia in Quebec back in 2015, um, and it the and it was published in the Toronto Star and uh, the fallout from that article was just madness like I've never gotten that much hate mail you know I, from ISIS or Al Qaeda or Nazis <laughs> as I did from people in Quebec basically being like. You're a Quebec basher, you know. You're uh, why? Why is this Anglophone talking in an Anglophone paper about Quebec? Yada yada yada. Um, it was just like stream. And then I, I think we were talked about on like the far right radio show in Quebec, and um, yeah, it just went on and on and on. But uh, that I mean, it's it's bizarre how protective kind of some Quebecers are of their of their identity, and, and even the mention of anti-Islamic, you know, anti-Islamic sentiment uh, sets them off. Yeah, there's been kind of an interesting trend. I mean, I mean, maybe Trump made it a bit more prominent or like people talked about it a bit more, but I feel like there's, you would probably obviously know much better, but I, I guess as someone that's a commoner that's kind of just observing, I'm seeing this kind of general increase or trend of like radicalization, not just of like, you know, uh, you know, um, like Islamic fighters and things like that, but like, especially in North America around like the far right movement. And, you know, one of the things that's kind of come out of that is two things, cancel culture. And number two is, I feel like there's this lost ability that used to, we used to have where we could have discussions, we could disagree and like we can kind of move on and still, you know, maintain relationships versus 
now it's like if you don't agree with i feel like that's one of the reasons why people become more radical is that you know the middle or the center just keeps if you don't agree with what they're saying it's like they just push you off to this you know corner where the only other people you have to talk to are people like you and then it's just kind of like an echo chamber after that so i'd love to kind of hear your thoughts around like those two topics too yeah, no, I think I think the mainstreaming of some of that definitely started. I mean, it was always present. Um, I mean, the, the 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 most the largest increase we saw of, of hate movements was actually after the election of Obama in two thousand eight. Um, like the number of neo-Nazi groups in the U.S. just went through the roof. Um, partly because you know now you've elected a black president and and we have to kind of undo where the U.S. is going, et cetera. Um, but it still wasn't mainstreamed in the same way. And it was still kind of fringe guys in the dark corners of the internet talking to themselves. Um, that changed with leading up to Trump in some ways, because what Trump did was um, he provided a kind of bridge between the dark corners of the internet and the White House, right? And so what, what used to exist just on 4chan or 8chan or um some of these uh more hate hate-filled forums like iron march um then made it into the alex jones universe um and then from alex jones it made it onto kind of twitter influencers and then trump was retweeting them right trump was retweeting them trump's team was retweeting them and so all of a sudden what used to exist in the dark corners of the internet and die in the dark corners of the internet um was now you know was officially <laughs> retweeted by the by the president of the United States, and so that that part was unique, right? That part was new, um, and it was quite worrisome because that basically gave license to a lot of these groups, which who were usually ignored by those in power, to now be like, oh, we have an ally in the White House, we have someone who agrees with us in the White House. Um, so that was a that was a big problem, and the consequences of some of that is that politics, as you say has now become elevated to the extent of um, almost like a good versus evil, right? So it's no longer just, oh, I'm a Democrat, you're a Republican, I disagree with you, we can have a policy conversation and move on. It's that, no, you are now evil. Um, it's now you stand for uh, principles and beliefs and policies that are fundamentally evil um, and harmful to the Republic, harmful to the country um, and harmful, you know, anti-patriotic. And so it, the the differences always were there, but they've now become like very emotionally intensified. Um, and and so this is where you get kind of families breaking up and siblings not talking to each other anymore because mild political, mild and fairly boring policy differences have now become like culture war issues, um, have become <clears throat> emotionally invested. And so um, that is also somewhat unique and it's increasing quite a bit. And so that that's my worry going forward into like, 2024 election um, in the US in particular, um, what that might mean. Um, in Canada, the same the same thing isn't really happening at that scale, but you, st you do start to notice similar trends. I mean, Trudeau in, in kind of the Nazi forums that I'm circulating in sometimes, you know, you see Trudeau constantly called uh, a traitor and calling for his head and calling for his assassination, um, that kind of stuff, which, um, is, is also not, not particularly new, but it's, it's elevated and right? it's increasing. Um, and so, you know, the, the same kind of trend in the US happens in Canada, but usually at a either a bit more quieter and, and, a, and a bit more slower as well. And I feel like, um, you know, on talking about that, you know, subject evil versus, you know, good versus evil, you know, I mean, for me, when I look at politics, I guess the reason I don't like it is I feel like you have these parties that are kind of, you know, when you think conservative, in my mind, it's like, depending on kind of where you see the ads or the type of people you talk to, it's like evil and then liberals are good. But then you look at the actual policies, I feel like the policies and like the head of the parties have kind of been like tied together or like, I don't know, the extremes, like, because, you know, when I look at the conservative policies, there's some things that are, you know, good there. If you look at liberal policies or some of the things that are good there, but there's also bad. But I just feel like, you know, I think the conservatives, you can tell me, you know, this is my assessment, but like, I feel like with what was happening in the US, I feel like that scared a lot of Canadians into trying to make sure that the conservatives or like what the equivalent of Republicans would be in the Canada would not come to power because they foresaw something like that happening. And then, you know, maybe that's maybe why Trudeau got elected. But um, yeah, I just I want to hear, I'm curious about that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely a fear there with like the, some of these patriot parties that have popped up, these uh, separatist groups that have popped up in the West, uh, West as in um, Alberta. Alberta. 
Um, and, and so, uh, you know, Wexit and so on. I think, I think that is definitely something that's freaking people out because all of that used to be undercurrent, right? It used to just go, unless you went looking for it, um, you, you would find a random website or something, but now it's like, oh, it's a, out in the open, it's attracting some uh, listeners. Um, so there is a worry of what, where, where is all that going to lead and are they going to gain enough of a following um, uh, to actually be a political threat, which I, I mean, it's probably it's still still a few years, maybe a decade or so off unless we change something. But um, but it is, it is now, you know, at least part of the conversation. What even what kind of spurred all this on more recently is, of course, COVID and lockdown and quarantine, um, the number of conspiratorial thinking, con conspiracy groups like QAnon, uh, COVID conspiracy theories, um, fears of the quote unquote great reset, uh, all these things um, went through the roof, right, on social media starting in March 2020. Um, and so um, what used to, again, be slowly growing got, got a bit of a boost because of the coronavirus um, issue. Um, and so hopefully with everybody vaccinated and things opening up again, that goes back down to a quiet rumble. But um, I think th there is a worry there of what uh, the COVID pandemic did uh, for social polarization, because um, you have a lot of people who believe that the government is lying to you, that COVID is a hoax, that the vaccine is, ha has other objectives behind it to control the population, um, that lockdown is being done for a particular purpose. and. So it really erodes kind of trust in government, trust in the media, trust in science, trust in medicine and public health officials. And that has impacts, right? Like that, 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 that that's not just something that exists. I mean, people, people actually don't vaccinate their kids because of that, or they don't vote because of that. And so it has long running consequences for kind of how, for our democratic republic and democratic functioning. Um, Part of part of what works makes democracy work is trust in government, and that's been on a steady decline for the last several decades. And so, um, and got a boost because of the COVID pandemic. And so, the, the con long term consequences are, are going to be interesting to watch. Yeah, you talked about like this general trend, or maybe it's just maybe more emergence in media. And talked about but this kind of desire from people to have the government less involved, which doesn't make sense in the sense that you know. A lot of things they talk about, you know, like in the U.S. with gun rights or like, you know, they're OK with like private health care and things like that. But I just find it interesting that people want all the benefits that the government kind of set up or created or gave, gave inertia to, like setting up a health care system or like, you know, free speech. But then I don't know, it's like um, they're kind of like hypocrites. I mean, when the government encroaches just a little bit too much in kind of the areas they don't want them touching, they don't want the government involved. And then I feel like that's also kind of leading to part of why cryptocurrency or blockchain is becoming more popular, which is this idea right now we kind of have physical states, which is kind of created by like land, you know, um, you know, like invisible boundaries based on land. A cryptocurrency or like blockchain is starting to kind of create conversations among futurists, which is the future will no longer kind of be states that are kind of physical, but more like digital or like, you know, you have, you know, um, I forgot the term, but like city, I forgot the exact term, but something around like digital cities or digital states, but yeah, maybe if you kind of speak on that a bit too. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't really know a whole lot about digital currencies um, other than what I hear from John Oliver. But <laughs> but, but um, no, I mean, I think this broader transnationalization is something that we're noticing as well in terms of, um, I mean, people forget how even, even a few decades ago, that wasn't possible, right? This kind of instant communication across boundaries and across national boundaries wasn't, this wasn't always the case. And, and so, um, so, but that, that shift of speed and scale um, obviously has impacts on societies and obviously has impacts on individuals and, um, and, and fosters kind of increased social polarization as well, because I mean, uh, I mean, take Gaza, for example, how quickly, that kind of movement against what happened in Israel, Palestine, just in the last few weeks, uh, that conversation shifted, right? What happened in Gaza was immediately communicated around the world um, and and activists around the world mobilized and, and to respond and governments had to respond in some form or another. Um, that wasn't always the case. And, and, and so I think how you can leverage some of that for broader social change um, will be interesting. I just don't know enough about the kind of capitalist side of it or the economic side of it to know what that's gonna look like, but I'm sure 
but but that's also part of the conversation right like the critique of capitalism critique of global markets mm. is also part of that movement um i just don't know whether it's viable or not because i don't know anything <laughs> but yeah but, but but it's definitely part of the conversation like because i've just been seeing more and more kind of online or just talking to people informally kind of across the globe around like either more people are going to places where you know there's kind of less government and intervention or like more digital friendly or just seeing more people if they live in say Canada, but you know, they don't, you know, maybe the community or province they live in, they don't agree with kind of the policies or the people they live with. They're kind of they're more participating in kind of digital kind of yeah. online states with people that have the same interests. Like maybe it's like far right people or like, you know, just other things. So I was just curious about your thoughts there. Um, Did you know that every time you left a five out of five review for this podcast, a Tamil parent lets their child pursue a career in the creative arts? Okay, that's probably not true, but if there's a chance that it is, do you really want to jinx it? Leave a review. Do it for the young creative in you. One of the things that, you know, we actually didn't get into was I kind of gave an intro, which is, you know, butchered, but you do you have a bunch of different interesting titles and you do. I feel like when I picture academia, I picture like, you know, a stuffy looking professor, you know, who's not into hip hop, who's not like, you know, a break dancer. And you're like super active on Twitter. You know, Twitter is one of those platforms I... I you kind know, of I, I post stuff on or reshare, but I know there's like a, a good way of using it. But anyways, I feel like you just don't fit the stereotype of what most people would think when they think academia. Um, so what exactly? How did you get it? Like, I guess how did you make this a career, a job? Like, you know, I think you mentioned your TC article, and people ask you what you do. It's kind of really hard to describe. Yeah. And like only after you kind of get it, got no notoriety, you're like doing interviews, you're kind of in more famous spaces, people are kind of taking you more seriously. But yeah, how do you describe what you do? Um, I mean, now, now that I'm a prof, it's a bit different than before, but I think before um, academic life, or at least leading up to being a prof is you think and read and write all day, right? And so this is why I often tell people it's not for everyone because there's a lot of people who are like, oh, I love research, I wanna do research. But they all, what, what they mean by that is, they like reading news articles or they like um, reading what other people are producing, right? Um, and, and, and so what I mean by research is you're going out and talking to people, you're gathering information, you're answering a particularly important research question or trying to solve a policy dilemma um, and actually producing knowledge, right? Creating knowledge. Um, and, and so if you, I think people forget that like whenever they read something online, um, that someone that that took some work, right? That someone had to go out and do something. Um, uh, and so, it, so it's funny. Because, I mean, the the foreign fighter stuff. People who went off to fight in Syria and Iraq is a good example. Like, it literally took me six years, maybe, of traveling around the country and around the world to build a spreadsheet of like eighty to ninety people that we know have gone over and fought. Um, so when someone says, "Oh, what does your spreadsheet look like?" and I say, "Oh, it's ninety people." they're like oh you it took you seven years to do that um but but nobody else has that right? <laughs> and so the the, the the process of research um is something that people still don't really understand in terms of how people produce information or how people gather gather knowledge i mean that's kind of what i do all day um is read write and think right and and now with being employed at a university that obviously comes with teaching and um, other other administrative duties that are part of it. But um, when I was a postdoc or when I was working at a think tank or contract, you know, do, doing random contract work with the UN and, and other um, international organizations, it, it was basically someone would give you a particular research question and you go and find a way to answer that. Uh, you talk to people, you do surveys, focus groups. Um, and, and you try to find a way to answer that. Uh, and, and in the Tamil community, um, that was weird, right? <laughs> um, I remember like my parents from the very beginning were like, we don't, nobody understood what the hell I was doing. Um, nobody understood what, the, what, what it was about. And so even when I did my major in history or political science and people are like, I don't like, what are you gonna do with all this? Um, and so luckily more people are doing it now um, and more people have actually done something with it, um, either, uh, either you know, some sort of government job or think tank job or, or what have you. And so it's a, it's a bit easier now, but I think, I think there's still, still the assumption of everyone should be a doctor and lawyer or engineer and that's it, right? And, and so anyone outside of that framework 
um, doesn't make sense. Um, and I mean, your podcast is, is a good example of that is most of the people you've interviewed um, wouldn't make sense to my parents, right? And um, so um, I think that that struggle continues, um, but having a, working at a university, I remember when it changed, right? It, 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 the 2014 October attack happened in Ottawa and I was interviewed by Peter Mansbridge and everyone that worked with my mom at CIBC saw the interview and they went and told her and they saw the last name because they don't know what I look like, but they saw the last name and then they approached her and they're like, is that your son, right? Um, and that was the moment when my mom's like, oh, like if Peter Mansbridge is talking to you, <laughs> so, <laughs> there must be something going on. You're not just sitting in your room talking to yourself. Um, and, and so that was the kind of cultural shift where they're like, oh, like there's people who find value in knowing stuff. Um, and, and so that was good. And then once I got employed, then the whole conversation shifted. It's, it's very difficult to find an academic job, but there aren't many universities hiring, um, particularly full-time tenure track positions. Um, so once that happened, then now they just tell people, oh, he's a teacher, right? Or he's, he's, a, he's a teacher at Queens or something like that. So now they're, now my job is more in line with what they're used to hearing, which is, oh, he's a teacher somewhere. Um, but the research side, they, they still couldn't really navigate what that means. I feel like that's a classic case of like external validation, yeah. creating instant, <laughs> instant internal credibility within the community and your family. Yeah, the only the only thing better better than Peter Mansbridge might might have been like City TV or something, because <laughs> it's like all brown people watch City TV. One of the things I'm curious about is like kind of the monetization in the academia world, because like, I I feel like yeah, one of the paths you can take is kind of tenureship and kind of working specifically with the university but you know you've written books you, do, you said yeah. you did contract projects with certain you know maybe uh both local and global organizations and also even from like the Substack as well uh, or like sorry from the journalistic side when you write for organizations um i'm seeing more and more people like you said it took you seven years to gather 90 names and put together this you know great piece of research i feel like the money or like or the respect that was journalists were being given or people like yourself doing that research and telling these great stories i feel like more and more of those people are going down the path of being individual creators so for example like substack or ghost or these platforms where instead of being paid by an institution or company to do this kind of work or tell these stories you know you built a following through twitter or like whatever else you're doing like other work you're doing have you ever thought of kind of going on a substack or ghost and kind of monetizing this new influence that you have by all the work that you do? Not really. I mean, I think because we're employed, particularly as a pro professor, I mean, we we work at a publicly funded university. Um, uh, I feel like the stuff I produce should be free. Um, <clears throat> and so, I mean, it's, it's almost like taxpayers have already paid for what I'm going to find, right? And, and so um, I feel like what, what I produce should be free to some extent. I mean, I'm not going to hand over entire data sets or anything like that. But um, I think the involvement in that is, is, is already built in in, in, in some, some sense. Um, that's not to say I don't do side projects or, you know, contract work. Um, uh, I, I still do work with the UN here and there. I still do work with different think tanks that... Um, produce work, but I mean, I'm already paid to teach and research. And so I feel like, um, yeah, that's already kind of baked in. Got it. And, you know, I, like I said, I know you're quite active on Twitter and I don't know how you feel about social media in general, but like, I guess I look at it as almost like a necessary evil, depending on how you look at it. I just look at it as a tool, just like a car. But how do you feel about social media, especially in your kind of line of work? Do you find it useful to kind of build credibility? Because part of the research that you produce or the you know stories that you tell comes from your credibility of who you are. Like you said, a Peter Mansbridge telling a story is different than some Joe Schmo kind of off the street. So do you feel like Twitter is kind of that um, a, a part of your credi credibility building machine or yeah? No, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think what Twitter is uh, interesting for or useful for, particularly for academics or people who are basically doing anything. I mean, if you're a journalist, if you're a writer, um, is that it, it, it speeds up your credibility building in a way, right? And so, sometimes that happens to people who don't deserve that credibility. <laughs> but, but I think it, because other people are validating you on a daily, sometimes minute by minute basis, um, you, you get a pe people that other people trust uh, may engage with your stuff that you're putting out, which then makes you trustable, trusted to them, right? And so a good example of this is um, I, I 
I forget after which attack, I think there was a, there was a sarin gas attack in Syria, uh, chemical weapons attack in Syria. Um, and I did like this very short, you know, four tweet thread about the history of sarin gas attacks that have ever happened. There's only been a handful of attacks where sarin was, has been used. Um, and so I kind of just said, here's the four things that have, four times that sarin has been used. And the editor of the Atlantic magazine got in touch with me uh, over DM on Twitter um, and said, do you, do you want to turn this thread into an article? And I said, sure. And so that was my first publication, I think, with The Atlantic, um, which wouldn't have happened without Twitter, right? Because um, I don't know the editor of Atlantic, <laughs> or at least I didn't before that. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting platform to kind of um, put yourself out there very quickly and gain, gain some presence very quickly. Um, and, but it is a kind of internal, kind of self-coherent, self-referencing ecosystem, right? Because sometimes it's funny because I'll like tweet an article uh, or tweet the contents of an article and I'll get like 50 new followers. But if I just tweet the article, no one reads it, right? And so it's almost like people don't want to really leave Twitter to talk to to read things. So it, all, it has to all be in Twitter, right? Because they, they're just scrolling and reading. Um, and so if you make them kind of do too much work, the engagement goes down. Um, so they want, so they want to kind of have all the content that they need to know right in the tweet or right in the thread. Um, this is why I do a lot of quoting. Like you might see, uh, I'll, I'll quote like the first paragraph of an article when I tweet the article because um, people, that just give, gives people everything they need to know about the article. They're not going to click on it. They're not going to read it. Um, but I also don't want to spread misinformation. So here's everything you need to know in 140 characters. Um, so because it's a kind of internal referencing kind of platform, um, you have to you have to navigate it a certain way to get engagement. Um, but it but because all the academics are on there, all the experts are on there, government folks are on there, um, it, it it is a useful place to be, much more than like Facebook and Instagram, which is very different, um, or LinkedIn, which is very different. But um, I think I think the, the the ability to kind of put yourself out there. Is, is quite useful for Twitter I've, and, and it has real life impacts, right? I've been to conferences where people I don't know or people I only know from Twitter have come and been like, oh, I love your Twitter feed, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it's like, it's like they, they already know who you are, which, which, if you, which if you, if you, I mean, as you know, like it's half the battle, right? Uh, getting people to trust you, getting people to take you seriously, getting people to like your personality, want to be around you, is like 70% of the struggle. <laughs> and so Twitter kind of makes a lot of that easier so that when people meet you for the first time, a lot of the a lot of that hard part is already done. Um, and so you can kind of move on to actually building a friendship or something. Yeah, I agree with you. One of the platforms I've been kind of heavily investing, kind of learning and putting time into is like LinkedIn, Instagram a bit as well, um, Facebook here and there, but Twitter is something I'm trying to get into because there's a guy that I follow like in the startup world and um, he basically did like this tweet storm, like kind of like a thread that went viral. Like um, it was basically like why Clubhouse will fail, but he wrote it in an interesting way, all in Twitter, kind of structured as an episode of Silicon Valley. And yeah. it went berserk. Like he basically, like I didn't understand it, which is what got me interested in Twitter, which was, you know, he got like a, a appearance on CNBC. He got a book deal offered to him, all that stuff. So you're right. It's kind of like a, a platform where people don't want to leave it to kind of get all the information they need. But I still don't understand. I'm trying to figure it out. I know, I know they're like rolling out new features like Twitter Pro or Twitter Premium. Twitter Premium. They're trying to improve the interface where kind of you can read threads almost like an article. So we'll see. I'm trying to learn it, but I'm trying to figure it out. I mean, this is, the thing I struggle with also is um, I think this is a, this is an assumption that a lot of us have is whenever there's a new platform, you also have to jump on that, right? It's that, yeah. so I, you know I I I tried TikTok for like a day and a half, got bored <laughs> of it. I jumped onto Clubhouse, got bored of it. Um, and I, so I, 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 you know, I use Facebook to post random things. I use Instagram almost as like a travel diary. Um, and I use Twitter for all politics and hip hop and making fun of things um, or screaming into the void. <laughs> um, and, and, and so I use platforms for different reasons, but I also don't feel like I have to jump on new ones. Um, like a, couple, a few friends of mine are big on Clubhouse, right? And I've never really gotten into it, maybe because I have kids and no time, but it's like this idea of just sitting and listening to kind of ongoing conversations. I don't, I don't, I don't see the value, but um, how are you? Are you on Clubhouse as well? Or? No, I, I, same like you, I guess I could just get, didn't get the premise. I was like, I'd rather just 
I want to hear people talk. I'll just listen to podcasts where I know what's, <laughs> what they're going to say versus hoping that they're going to say something interesting. So yeah. that's kind of why I never got into it. So the, the other thing that's happening on Clubhouse apparently is a lot of activist mobilizing, which is useful, right? So a lot of people are um, talking uh, about things that were happening in Syria or Iraq or Israel, Palestine, and actually mobilizing transnationally with people. Um, so that that's probably a useful element to it. But yeah, it's kind of like speed gate speed dating at, at a at a public park or something, right? Like you, <laughs> you just walk up to families, but like, so what are you guys talking about? Uh, <laughs> so I'm like, I don't really want to do that. Um, so I haven't, I haven't really, it hasn't really caught on for me. Got it. Money can be hard to come by, but here is a hundred dollar opportunity for you. Join my free newsletter for free exclusive content and a free chance to win a hundred dollars when I hold special draws. Did I mention that it's free? What's like, a, you know, obviously you've written books, but like, what's like a book that you read or even like a podcast, I'm not sure if you have a podcast, but uh, that you have either read or listened to in the last couple of years that you've really kind of enjoyed or has kind of a, a big impact on you? I'm halfway through uh, this book called This is How They Tell Me the World Ends, which is about uh, cybersecurity and cyber threats, which is written very thriller, you know, uh, creative nonfiction. Um, so I'm, I'm really enjoying that at the moment. It's like 500 pages, but it's, 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 a, it's a good one. Um, i trying to think what else. I mean, Policing Black Lives by Robin Maynard, um, which I read right after the Floyd, um, the, the murder of George Floyd was was quite powerful. Um, yeah, I'm reading a lot on conspiracy theories now because I'm supposed to be probably working on a next book on conspiracies. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I'm uh, looking at. In terms of recent podcasts, there was one called um, Hunting Warhead, which was about uh, this online uh, like sexual abuse predator um, and, and the way they hunted him down. It's like amazing. Um, I think it's on... I think it's called Hunting Warhead or something like that. But it, but it, but it, that was quite good. Um, I haven't actually kept up with a lot of podcasts because my commute a- ended with COVID, <laughs> and so the only time I had time to listen to podcasts was when I was driving to Kingston or Queens, um, and so that's basically come to a halt. Got it. Uh, you, you just mentioned like something I forgot to ask you earlier. You've written a lot of books. I'm curious about like book deals or like I guess I know you write, part of it, why you might write them is for credibility, but. Do you like these organizations or publishers reach out to you to publish stuff or do you like like say, hey, I have an idea and you reach out to publishers to be like, hey, I want to publish a book about this subject. And then how does it work in terms of the monetization of these you know, book deals? Um, so there's two types of publishing. One is the academic publishing, which I do, which involves writing a book proposal about your topic, pitching it to different publishers. Uh, university publishers, you know, University of Toronto Press, McGill Queens Press, um, Columbia University Press, whatever it might be, and they send it out for review to two people. Um, the reviewers come back and say this is good, and then you get a contract, a book contract, and then you're expected to deliver a complete manuscript. I don't know in a year, in a year and a half or something like that. Um, the royal, the money from that comes from royalties, which usually for academic presses is like seven to ten percent. And you're all, you're also not you know you're not selling like selling like um, Malcolm Gladwell, and so you're not <laughs> making you're not making a whole lot of money. Um, but it's mostly yeah, it's mostly for um, academic credibility, for producing research, that sort of thing. Um, the other style of publishing is more popular publishing, which is much more difficult to do, which involves you first convincing an agent, a literary agent, that you're uh competent that you have good ideas um getting them to buy into you and sign you on and then having a conversation with the agent about what kind of book you want to write and then that agent running around and trying to sell the idea Um, and so they usually try to sell it with not university presses but like penguin random house vintage uh simon and schuster that sort of thing um, and then the same process happens and you get a contract. Sometimes it comes with an advance. Um, if you're like big time, you can get like a you know $50,000 advance or if you're Obama, you can get several million. Um, <laughs> and uh, then you're expected to produce the book, right? And I think the advance gets taken from your profits. And so until you pay it back, right? And so you sell, you know, a couple hundred million copies, uh, you pay back the advance and then everything else you get to keep. Usually the 
um, royalties for those books are a bit higher or can be depending on who you are again. If you're the president of the United States, your royalties are probably higher. Um, so you, that could be anywhere between you know 10 and 20%. Um, but the yeah, the popular market, um, if you have a good agent, especially that, that's who gets you on the talk shows, that's who gets you, that's who you know markets it very well. The university presses don't do a whole lot of marketing. I mean, they send it to university uh, libraries, they send it to a few journals who may ask someone to review it, publish a 600 word review that nobody reads. Um, and it just kind of dies that way. But unless unless now, you know, you're on Twitter and you can kind of push it that way. Um, but the marketing side is way more powerful on the on the popular publications, but it's also much harder to be one of those people. Um, are, are there advances on the academic publishing side? And like, how do you get visibility of how many books they sell? Like, do they send you a report or like, how does that work? Yeah, every, um, no, there's no advances usually on the academic side. Uh, they send you a little report every four months being like, your, your book sold 60 copies. And <laughs> and it was, uh, or, you know, uh, six hardcovers and four, 40 uh, eBooks on Kindle. And then they do the math and they're like, now your here's a check for 30 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> And so you're not you're not getting rich off academic publishing. So. Makes sense. Um, so, in terms of like you know you're doing all this amazing work and you know just looking forward, how do you look at your personal legacy? Like if you want to get your friends and family to describe you in a few sentences, like how would you want to be remembered? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, I can give you the cliche answer of like, you know, you want to leave the play world a better place, but and, and I think that's true. It's just how to do that. Um, we come at it different ways, right? And so I think ideally you wanna produce something that people remember you by, that people are still reading and citing 20, 30, 40 years from now. That usually doesn't happen for most academics. Um, you know, I, uh, I can count on probably one hand articles that I still read that were published in the seventies or eighties, right? It's not, most academics aren't, most stuff isn't read. Um, the other thing, of course, is teaching. And so you want to kind of leave a legacy through your students, um, uh, like the way I talk about my supervisors and, and, people, and my mentors and, and who um, at particularly important times in my life kind of nudge me in this direction or that. Um, I still remember all of them, all my high school teachers who did that, all my university teachers who did that. Um, so I think that legacy is probably much more achievable <laughs> than producing this kind of brilliant text that's going to change the world. Um, but I mean, that's kind of where I place my energies is be a good teacher, do good research, try to be a good friend. Um, I, I, I do a lot of mentorship with students. Um, people, that, people that aren't even at Queens or you know, at my school, I Skype and Skype with them all the time about their research ideas, their proposals that are due, um, that sort of thing. And so that's kind of where I see my place, I guess. Um, yeah. What, what's an insecurity that you have? Um, being being insignificant. That I mean that <clears throat> I think um, this comes from uh, one of my er early mentors in undergrad was, um, are you going to do anything that matters, right? Um, and and so because I study social consequences and social things that have social impact, um, it is a kind of constant nagging that like, are you yourself having any social impact? <laughs> Um, and so it, it is it is a nagging kind of uh, insecurity in terms of I don't know if insecurity is the right word, but it's it's a it's a nagging kind of concern that you can live 80 years of your life and you know nothing happens um, and you haven't really done anything in the outside world. Um, so I mean you can try to you know it's a good it's a good concern to have because then you can kind of actively work to try to fix it. Um, who is somebody from the global Tamil community that you admire and why? And who's one person that isn't Tamil that you admire and why? Global Tamil community. Um, I mean, he's gonna he's gonna blush when he hears this, but I think uh, Kumaran Nadesan, who's my age, which is weird to say, someone my age, but I think his energy for, to kind of create all constant things is is interesting, and I I make endless fun of him for it, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I think his ability to, and he's been doing it since like 2002, right? It's like a good chunk of the organizations that exist in the Tamil diaspora, he has a hand in in one form or another, um, uh, or at least he advised or talked to people who created it. And so 
that energy is interesting to me because I'm like not that person. Um, and he and it's, we have conversations like this all the time where like he'll create he'll create a WhatsApp group with some new organization and then add me to it. And I'm like, why why am I here? <laughs> um, and and so his his constant ability to be like, this is what's required in the Tamil community, and I'm I'm going to do it right because all all, all of a lot of us will talk about the gaps in the Tamil community and what's lacking in the Tamil community, but I'm not doing anything about it. Right? <laughs> and so uh, he's one of these guys who's like, okay, I'm going to create an organization and then we're going to have meetings and we're going to we're going to have spreadsheets, <laughs> we're going to have spreadsheets and budgets and we're going to go for grants. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, you know. Um, so I so I, I admire that energy because I it's like not at all how I think about things. Um, in terms of like quickly organizing and getting things done. <laughs> that, that's probably an academic thing, um, to be fair. So, and in terms of non-Tamil, that's a tough one. I mean, I think probably one of my uh, my PhD supervisor is a good option. Uh, so he's Lauren, Lauren Dawson from University of Waterloo. Um, I admire him because he's he brought me on the journey, right? Because as, as he was moving into different fields, um, and I was poor and unemployed and had a family to feed. He kind of, op he, he made sure I also walked through the doors that he was walking through, um, which is fundamentally important for a PhD supervisor, which I think a lot of PhD students don't understand because the stories I hear from other PhD students is like, oh, I haven't spoken to my supervisor in a year and a half. I'm like, what is, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, and, and so the ha choosing a good supervisor who not only can help you get through the PhD, but also like make sure you're set up, right? Make sure, you're, make sure your ducks are, are in a row when, when you're kind of out the door by yourself is hugely important. Um, otherwise you're just floundering. Um, you, you'll have a PhD, but you won't know anybody. You won't have any uh, projects. You won't have any ideas of what you're doing next. And a lot of and that happens a lot where people just kind of disappear or they become disillusioned with academia and they, you know, so there's a lot of these Twitter accounts who are like recovering academic, you know, <laughs> um, and I, I often chalk that up to you didn't have the right supervisor, right? You didn't have the right mentor to kind of walk you through what, what needs to happen. Um, so yeah, I would, I would, I would place him up there. What's a piece of advice you'd give to your fellow, you know, Tamil creators out there and you could start general and then maybe have a uh, sub, you know, advice for like specifically those who might be considering academia? Um, I've been very impressed. I think I talked about this in the article, in the TC article as well, is that I've been very impressed with the new conversations that are happening. Um, because I think there was the kind of civil war legacy until 2009, where basically the entire entirety of the diaspora conversation was was focused on Sri Lanka, was focused on the, on the cause. Um, whereas, literally like after 2012 i noticed like gay rights magazines pop up and people having um you know new and new newer and newer different cultural conversations what it meant to be a young person um in the diaspora in, in new ways queer discussions which hadn't really existed before um and so my advice would be to just make sure things that you that you feel are lacking in the diaspora the conversation the entirety of the conversation in the community um, don't be afraid to be the one to kind of start that conversation, right? Because I think there's, in, particularly with a lot of us coming of age now, um, we are our parents' generation, right? Like we're, you know, I'm 39, turning 40. Um, you have support now. It's, it's not, it's not like the old, old generation where you've, you, you have to kind of worry about how it's going to be received, whether you're going to be excommunicated. Um, whereas there's enough of us who are old now and in positions of power and in positions of privilege that you're that you'll be supported right and so if you feel like some conversation isn't happening um be the for, be the one to start it and there's way more avenues on which to start that conversation than ever before um you know whether it's podcasts or social media platforms or whatever um or blogs and, and outlets to write um than ever before so you can kind of uh tamil culture is a good good example um of, of putting those ideas out there and and um not being not being worried about it. Um, in terms of getting into academia, um, I would I would I mean I would be a little worried these days about um, I would I, I would say do it of course if you if you feel like you love reading and writing and coming up with new ideas and researching and going out and talking to people um, it's an enormous privilege to kind of be paid to do that. Um, 
and to, to be to to kind of have the freedom to do do that kind of stuff but the landscape of employment <laughs> is changing drastically um and you might find yourself in a position where you have to do different kinds of jobs to make ends meet whether it's contract work or think tanks or uh, enter government um work in policy that sort of thing so don't um, maybe expand what what you think the phd means right and where you might end up you might not be a prof um there's a there's so many unemployed phds um and and so uh, set yourself up from from the, from year one of the phd to kind of also work outside the uh, outside the academy um because it, that's very likely where things are going like there's no hires right people are mountains of people are retiring and they're not refilling those positions um and we're still graduating phd students <laughs> so there's going to be a lot of people who don't have jobs that's great advice that's kind of a good segue into kind of you know from the serious part of the discussion into what i call uh creative confessions it's kind of a fun speed round i'm going to ask you a bunch of questions and you're just going to give me quick answers on like what you're thinking okay it's the hot seat that's the hot seat there you go We'll start with some easy ones. So, favorite Tamil food? Kotroti chicken. Uh, something that scares you? Alligators. <laughs> Interesting one. Um, Hip hop artist that you'd want to, you know, uh, have as a, a best friend? One, you can only choose one. Dead or alive? Dead or alive. Big pun. Uh, favorite show you're watching? Right now, um, I'm re-watching all of The Office. A place you're itching to travel to once the pandemic is over? Japan. That's my favorite place. Um, favorite Tamil creator, uh, sorry, fellow Tamil creator you want to give a shout out to? Um, I uh, shout out to Gautam and Kurosami, who's now, who who's just named or elected or voted uh, one of the best staffers in Ottawa. Um, so I, I knew him for several years, of course, and, and he's he's uh, done amazing things since. I don't know if he's a creator, as, as you define oh, it, but <laughs> definitely a creator. Uh, favorite childhood memory: um, dipping Ovaltine biscuits in hot tea. <laughs> Pet peeve. Oh God. Um, um, people who answer questions with more questions. <laughs> to me a uh, celebrity you look up to um, in terms of writing and complexity of thinking i would place eminem up there he's um i'm still amazed by what he does with the writing if you knew you were going to die tomorrow a regret that you would have um that i didn't travel more with the family celebrity whose life you want to experience for one day uh, Elon Musk. You're like the seventh person that said that. Damn, that guy's in our minds. Okay. And finally, a PSA you want to leave our audience with? Um, stay out of the comment section. It, <laughs> <laughs> because there's nothing good in there. Everything you're reading in there is fake or made up and it's poisoning your minds. Get out of there. Don't go there. Love it. You know, that was a great episode, Amar. Um, so, you know, I want to thank you for kind of jumping on. For people listening that kind of, you know, interest in academia or just kind of your story and want to connect with you or, you know, uh, pick pick your brain, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Is it through LinkedIn, Twitter? Like, you um, yeah, I mean, Twitter is where I kind of post everything that I do. So if I'm writing anything, reading anything, thinking something, you'll probably find it there first. Um, so that Twitter is at Amar Amar Singham. Um, email. Uh, is easily findable online if you just Google my name. Either my academic page or my um, personal stuff is all. I'm I'm all over the internet, sadly. Um, so, but but Twitter is the main spot where um, yeah, things things go down. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Amar, again for jumping on, and thank you guys for listening, and uh, look forward to seeing you guys on the next episode.